Good day, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. I'm honored to welcome you at the Bioengineering and Bioinformatics part of Lomonosov Conference with reports presented in English. Uh, I would like you to do a special frame of our speakers and switch off your mobile phones. The schedule has been changed a bit, and for the first speech in our today's agenda, let's welcome Ekaterina Shvitsova with her report on expression and purification of the peptide encoding by line 15000 11K16 of mass musculars. Good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. Uh, today I would like to present you my coursework, um, which is called The Peptide Encoded by LIM 150011K16RIC, Mass Musculus, Expression and Purification. As we all know, every cell contains a lot of different RNAs, and uh, not all of them have known functions and properties. Um, among those are so-called long non-coding RNAs. LNC RNAs are defined as uh, non-coding transcripts uh, which are longer than 200 nucleotides. Most of them um, have uh, complex secondary structures and uh, uh, are thought to play possible regulatory roles uh, in chromatin remodeling, uh, transcription, post-transcriptional processing, and uh, intracellular trafficking. For example, um, the LNC RNA called CIS uh, is known to code uh, one X uh, chromosome in female mammals and inactivated. In our laboratory, we are investigating the functions and properties of the corresponding um, RNA and uh, when our investigations just started, uh, it was annotated as uh, long non-coding RNA. But uh, we um, manually discovered the conservative open reading frame uh, in one of its exons. This, this open reading frame uh, encodes uh, a peptide of uh, 56 uh, amino acids uh, with a total charge of uh, um, 6.9 at pH 7. Um, moreover, the annotations of this uh, RNA has been changed uh, recently, and now uh, in the uh, ensemble database, for example, it is uh, annotated as protein coding RNA. Um, these are the reasons why uh, we became even, even more interested in this uh, LNC RNA and decided uh, to study the uh, functions and properties of the peptide encoded by the corresponding uh, open reading frame. So the main aim of our work was to get a sufficient amount of the recombinant peptide encoded by our LNC RNA. And having this uh, fewer peptide, we can obtain uh, antibodies uh, against it, which can be used to, to provide evidence of the peptide's presence in uh, eukaryotic cells uh, to determine its localization, and uh, these antibodies can also be used in immunoprecipitation um, experiments and uh, in Western blood analysis. Um, at the first uh, step of our work, uh, the corresponding open reading frame has been cloned into two different expression, uh, expression vectors, one with a uh, hexahistidine tag at the C end of the protein, and another one with a, a hexahistidine tag and Terpotes cleavage site at the N end of the protein. Then um, we performed the transformation of uh, these expression plasmids uh, into um, bacteria cells and uh, tried to check whether our recombinant peptide can be expressed in, uh, in E. coli. So here you can see uh, the Western blood analysis of um, um, the expression or the construction with the uh, uh, hexahistidine tag. And um, we can see a clear signal at about 10 uh, kilodeltons 
in the column which corresponds to uh, the cells with our expression plasmid. And at the same time, there is no such signal in the control cells. Uh, so we can conclude that our recombinant peptide can be expressed in E. coli. Um, then we performed a line of experiments uh, of uh, expression and purification, and uh, our procedure consists of uh, these crucial steps. Uh, first cell growing, then cell disruption, then binding uh, of the proteins to nitrosaferose, uh, which has an affinity to hexahistidine tag, um, then washing off the unnecessary proteins, and then the elution of our target protein uh, from nitrosaferose. Uh, to improve our results, we used um, different uh, methods and uh, uh, conditions almost at every step of our experiment. For example, we used different uh, ways of cell disruption, uh, various volumes of nitrosaferose, and uh, different uh, concentrations of uh, imidazole in the washing buffer. Uh, we also tried to, to obtain uh, the protein without any tags. And uh, to achieve this goal, we used our second expression plasmid, uh, which provides the expression of the peptide with uh, hexahistidine tag and supported cleavage site. Uh, so after the expression of uh, this recombinant peptide, uh, we used uh, TEF protease uh, to cut uh, our um, uh, tags, um, uh, to, cut, to, cut, to uh, cut our peptide um, between the two last uh, amino acids of uh, uh, TEF protease cleavage site, and this is uh, how we get uh, the uh, peptide without any tags. Uh, using TEF protease, uh, added some additional steps to our uh, expression and purification procedure. Uh, so, after the elution of our target uh, recombinant peptides from um, nitrosaferose, we performed the uh, specific proteolysis using TEF protease, and then we performed the second step uh, of the binding uh, to nitrosaferose uh, to get rid of the affinity tag and uh, of the TEF protease itself, because it also has a um, polyhistidine tag. And then we uh, collected uh, our target protein without any tags. However, uh, it turned out very difficult to detect uh, the presence of our protein in the final elution. So we had to use different methods of detection. Um, after the electrophoresis in the polyacrylamide gel, we either used a Western blot analysis or stain the gel and um, after the performing of the specific proteolysis of the protein band, uh, which uh, can uh, probably um, uh, be our uh, target peptide, we uh, uh, performed uh, the uh, analysis uh, using melting mass spectroscopy. Uh, so uh, we used uh, not only uh, Tris glycine is DSPH, but also Tris tricin is DSPH, which is more preferable uh, for smaller proteins. Um, and also we use different, uh, ma uh, different ways of staining. Uh, for example, staining with uh, Kamasi brilliant blue and uh, um, silver staining, and also staining with a uh, sensitive uh, Kamasi based stain called instant blue. So uh, here you can see uh, the um, results of, the, of our final experiment of expression and purification uh, analyzed using um, three strikes in this page with the instant blue staining. And here we can detect uh, some uh, protein bands uh, with which can correspond uh, to our uh, protein with a hexahistidine tag and a protease cleavage site, and one band uh, which probably correspond to our peptide without any tags. Uh, however, it turned, um, uh, however, even, uh, um, even though we performed uh, specific proteolysis and uh, 
multi uh, mass spectroscopy analysis uh, three times. Uh, we haven't managed uh, to confirm the presence of our peptide in the final emission. Uh, so we can conclude that uh, the possibility of the expression of our recombinant peptide in E. coli has been confirmed. And uh, uh, we can um, visualize the presence of uh, our recombinant peptide in the final evolution using uh, tree stricing SDS page with instant blue staining. Uh, but uh, its presence uh, very is very hard to be confirmed using uh, melding mass spectroscopy. Thank you for your attention. Yes, a question, please. So uh, you don't have the main department to test the, the peptide, right? Uh, right now, no. So the only evidence that you actually see it is obtained by instant blue, right? Yes. Uh, is silver staining you don't see? Um, we performed silver staining, but uh, there was um, mm, some results that we couldn't inter interpret uh, correctly. Uh, we, we still don't know why we can uh, we cannot see this protein using silver staining. Mm -hmm. So there is still the question is it the right protein code? Yes, of course it is because we uh, we haven't managed to confirm it with uh, melting mass spectroscopy. So uh, thank you for your question. Unfortunately, we don't have so much time to answer all your questions. So. Thank you for your speech. <laughs> now I would like you to welcome our second uh, speaker, uh, Irina Huen, with her report on high throughput screening of 20,000 chemical compounds for their antibiotic properties activity. So, so you have your word. Um, hello, dear colleagues and friends. I'm honored to present you my course work called High Throughput Screening of 20,000 Chemical Compounds for Their Antibiotic Activity. Uh, a problem of finding new antibiotics is very urgent now. Bacterial populations could easily acquire antibiotic resistance, so mankind always needs new antibiotics. Uh, this year, we've been uh, analyzing a library of 20,000 chemical compounds by the system that could not only detect antibiotic ability of the compound, but also can tell us something about its mechanism of action. Uh, basically, our report of construction is a plasmid that contains uh, a selective marker and uh, uh, genes of two or more fluorescent protein are the speci specific promoters and UTRs that will allow expression of uh, these genes uh, only under certain conditions. For example, in the uh, construction that was previously created in my laboratory, a gene of fluorescent, uh, pro uh, fluorescent protein was expressed only in case of ribosome stolen. Uh, our goals this year were to make new report of construction that, will, uh, that would allow us to cover more mechanisms of action and analyze a library of compounds using new reporter. Um, uh, this is our new reporter. In uh, the new reporter, uh, RFP is expressed only in case of DNA damage, and a fluorescent protein called Katushka is expressed only in case of ribosome stalling. Uh, and at this point, you may ask yourself, how exactly do these reporters work? Well, uh, the translational reporter uh, mechanism of its work uh, is based on butafan uh, attenuation mechanism. The region here was modified the way uh, it, is, uh, it became unsensitive to tryptophan concentration, but stays sensitive to ribosome stalling. Uh, so if ribosome stalls, a termination loop doesn't uh, form, and uh, RNA polymerase could transcribe Katushka uh, gene. Uh, and the second of our reporter for DNA damage, uh, it is based on LEX-A mechanism of action, uh, Lex A uh, represses expression of RFP under normal condition. Uh, but uh, if DNA is severely damaged, uh, rec uh, protease function of REC A is activated. 
So rep A leaves lex A uh, in case of DNA damage, and uh, RP uh, is free to be expressed. Uh, after creation or creation of our construction, we tested it uh, on antibiotics with known mechanisms of action. For example, we know that erythromycin uh, is an, an, an antibiotic that causes ribosome storing. So we uh, expected um, uh, bacterial cells in sub-inhibitory zone to produce Latusco fluorescent protein. Uh, so as you may see here, it happened. Uh, and we proved that our um, reporter works properly and produces two distinguishable signal signals. Uh, after that, we uh, put a started screening process. First of all, we transform <coughs> chemically competent bacterial cells with our uh, reporter plasmid. Uh, then we selected uh, cells that uh, actually have our construction by growing them on ampicillin-contained environment. After that, we grew overnight cultures uh, on liquid medium and made a smooth layer of cells on big square petri dish. Um, after that, we dripped our tested compounds on the cell layer uh, using automatic prepared system called Yadas that could simultaneously put 96 compounds on the cell layer. Then we incubated uh, cells in the compound for about 16 hours and visualize the results using Chemidoc. Uh, so this is how our screening dishes looks like in real life and taken by regular camera. And uh, this is uh, how our screening dish looks uh, photographed on imaging device. You need to understand that uh, this is not the actual colors of uh, these fluorescent proteins. Uh, th these colors are artificial. And here you see green light if the program detects RFP and red light if it detects Katushka. Uh, before every round of screening, we made a control probe. We put uh, a levofloxacin and erythromycin on bacterial cell layer to be sure that our reporter still works properly. Uh, let's finally go through some of the selected compounds and we'll start with, induct uh, with inductors of translational reporter. Uh, it's worth mentioning that there were a small amount of uh, com compounds that uh, induced uh, our translational reporter. And only five of them were uh, proven to be uh, direct uh, inhibitors of translation by in vitro translation experiments. Two of them you may see on the screen, and uh, as you may notice, they look pretty the same. They even have the same formula, uh, and they are actually positional isomers. Um, Let's move on to, some, uh, to the compounds that uh, caused the induction of Soleil reporter. And there were much more, uh, a larger number of compounds that induced our DNA damage reporter. They usually had bigger uh, inhibition zone and were more effective. So uh, the remarkable thing about the compound on the screen is that uh, it killed not only uh, delta 12 c strain of E. coli, but also wild-type strain of E. coli. That's why we think that uh, this compound may be uh, used as a drug in the future. Some of the compounds caused extreme induction of our Soleil reporter. Uh, this is uh, the example of this compound. And despite of causing such a dramatic effect, uh, such a dramatic expression of our reporter gene, uh, it causes no harm to bacterial cells, and we don't know why. And finally, uh, this compound uh, here, uh, in this compound uh, didn't induce uh, our reporters, but uh, it has one of the biggest uh, inhibition zones in the group of compounds that induce neither of our reporters. So we decided to investigate it. And a uh, test of in vitro translation uh, shows uh, that this compound has uh, a strange effect on translation uh, and the translation from one mRNA leads to two different uh, products. Again, we don't know mechanism uh, of its action. And we think that this compound has a potential to become a drug because of its low minimal inhibitory concentration that is comparable to uh, the one of erythromycin. Uh, so we can conclude that uh, 20 compounds were uh, identified as translational inhibitors and only five of them were proven to be direct translational inhibitors. Uh, unfortunately, none of them passed uh, MTC test for 
toxicity for aerocorotic cells, so they cannot be used in therapy. Uh, then a large amount of compounds induce expression from our source response reporter, and they are all yet to be tested. Uh, and as we think, some of the tested compounds have the potential to become a drug. Thank you for your attention. Feel free to ask any question. So now for questions. And, uh, yeah, yeah. No, they were all uh, like synthesized by some chemical. Yes. Sorry. Thank you for your question. And someone else, Svetlana, please a question. Why have you chosen uh, LCS? Uh, uh, we uh, actually my part of this report reconstruction was to made a pair for RFP protein and um, Tatushka protein was the best because. Uh, in pair, in the in with pair uh, with RFP, it produced uh, two distinguishable signals that we could detect uh, properly. That's why we have chosen this pair. Thank you for your question. And some more questions, uh, please. You mentioned something about MPG test, but uh, maybe I missed something. What kind of cell did you? Uh, I didn't uh, to, uh, talk about uh, in my presentation because I didn't make it myself because uh, and it was made by my colleagues in lab. So that means that uh, all your substances were found, 20 of them, yes? Five, found yeah, yeah. Five, mm -hmm. And all of them are toxic? Yes, to eukaryotic cells. cells. But they're still That's interesting mm -hmm. to my laboratory because my laboratory uh, investigates translation and we think that maybe these compounds uh, binds to some sites of ribosome and so on. That's why uh, I was talking about it so much. <laughs> okay, in bureaucracy in simulator, found the found by two compounds that mm -hmm. already known in the uh, Yes, some of them, uh, some of the compounds that we have uh, in our like place were known antibiotics and after screening them, we thought like, oh, it may be new antibiotic, <laughs> but we then look at the list of the compounds and say that it's... I'm talking not about that exactly, mm -hmm. I'm talking about the chemical simulator. Ah, chemical similarity. Uh, we actually want want to make it a further investigation okay. because we just have uh, now we just have like a list of compounds that passed uh, some tests and so on, and we will analyze this question further. Please. Mm -hmm. Do you have some idea about that tr truncated products? Uh, uh, no, truncated no, we don't. <laughs> uh, actually, um, here uh, one minute. Uh, here you can see like maybe a slight induction of our translational rep uh, reporter. So maybe these compounds like mildly stalled the ribosome and that's why this happened. But we don't know. This is a question for further investigation. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have much time. So thank you for your report. It was <laughs> really fascinating. And now our third speaker. Let's welcome Sofia Buyanova with her speech on the effect of dehydrated epiendosterone on inflammatory response in red astrocytes. Welcome. Um, good afternoon, dear colleagues. I'm happy to present my today's speech the effect of dehydrated androsterone and inflammatory response in rat astrocytes. Um, blue. Yeah. It, it doesn't work. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Check the picture. <laughs> um, Okay, thank you. 
Um, astrocytes and microglia are important components of, um, of near inflammation in response to inflammatory stimuli and trauma. Astrocytes restrict the inflamed tissues and produce pro and pro anti-inflammatory cytokines and um, inflammatory enzymes which participate in production of reactive oxygen, nitric oxide and prostaglandins. Uh, which um, and therefore are able to regulate uh, neuroinflammation processes. Um, activation of inflammatory response in astrocytes is shown in a slide. Uh, toll like receptor activation leads to increase uh, in various gene expression uh, activation, particularly the pro inflammatory cytokine TNF, uh, TNF alpha. Uh, the pro and anti-inflammatory cyclooxygenase and anti-inflammatory interleukin-10. Um, defects uh, in these mechanisms accompany a number of neurodegenerative disorders, including Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Uh, dehydroepiandrosterone is one of the most abundant pro um, steroid hormones in the human body and its concentration decreases uh, significantly with age. Um, in interestingly, it can actively be produced by astrocytes. A number of previous works um, um, uh, shown various uh, effects uh, after long-term intake of uh, dehydroepiandrosterone as dietary supplement. And um, the effects uh, the anti-inflammatory, anti-aging, neuroprotective, and a reducing fat mass and glucose levels were shown. However, the exact mechanism is still uh, unknown. It was also recently shown that the hydroepiandrosterone concentration in blood significantly increases with uh, the increase of uh, reactive, uh, reactive oxygen and uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine production. Um, the aim of our research was to study the anti-inflammatory effects of dehydroepiandrosterone. We suggested that this steroid concentration is an, is an important regulator in inflammatory response in brain, and the astrocytes could play an important role in this regulation. Uh, we hypothesized that dehydroepiandrosterone is involved in um, regulation of inflammatory response in astrocytes and propose a scheme presented on slide. But the connection between the increased concentration of dehydroepiandrosterone and the release of inflammation is still not studied. Uh, that is why the main aim of our work was to answer the question uh, whether dehydroepiandrosterone could modulate inflammatory response in uh, astrocytes and uh, an astrocyte and uh, propose an, uh, as this scheme and to um, propose the role of uh, dehydroepiandrosterone in uh, regulation of inflammation. To investigate uh, the missing part of a hypothesized scheme, we formulated the following aims to observe uh, changes in inflammatory, in inflammatory response in astrocytes in response to acute treatment and long-term treatment with the hydroepiandrosterone and to investigate the concentration dependence of the hydroepiandrosterone and the observed changes. Um, to conduct the experiments, primary cultures of rat astrocytes were isolated from laboratory rats and cultivated for two weeks. Astrocytes were ex exposed to different conditions and we used a TNF alpha COX2 interleukin 10 expression levels as markers of inflammation. We analyzed them with quantitative PCR. Um, in short term incubation with the hydroepiandrosterone, a slight decrease in TNF alpha, oh, I'm sorry, in TNF alpha levels. Uh, in an increase in cyclooxygenase and decrease, uh, increase in interleukin-10 levels were observed. We conclude that dehydroepiandrosterone has anti-inflammatory effect in astrocytes 
uh, in acute treatment with PM, and therefore PM mediates acute me uh, regulatory mechanism in astrocytes, um, in um, inflammation in astrocytes. Our next experiment was um, uh, with uh, the long-term TIA treatment. Um, it showed uh, similar results. So we conclude that dehydroatiandrosterone has anti-inflammatory effects in astrocytes in a long-term treatment, uh, and uh, which could have an impact in uh, TIA-mediated anti-inflammatory effect in brain in vivo. Um, Discussions around the working concentrations of dehydrated androsterone are made. In previous studies, uh, there were many different concentrations used to show the effects. So we studied and demonstrated that even low concentrations of dehydrated androsterone have still anti-inflammatory effect. And um, uh, a broad range of concentrations uh, have similar pro uh, pro uh, anti inflammatory effect. And um, altering the concentrations of uh, dehydrated androsterone significantly changes only interleukin 10 expression, uh, but not the cyclooxygenase 2. Uh, this suggests a complicated regulatory mechanism which have to be further investigated. So, our results show that uh, anti-inflammatory properties of dehydroepiandrosterone in inflammation in astrocytes are proven in, on transcriptional level. So, this proves the role of dehydroepiandrosterone in the proposed scheme, this link. Um, and uh, this suggests that the proposed scheme could actually really exist in uh, astrocytes. Um, so let's summarize our work. Uh, the effect uh, of acute and long-term incubations on, inf uh, on inf inflammation in astrocytes are proven on uh, mRNA level. Uh, TIA treatment has similar effects in a broad range of concentrations. And a role of astrocytes in a proposed scheme of dehydrated androsterone mediated uh, inflammatory response is proved. Um, thank you for your attention. I will be glad to answer your questions. So, your questions, please. Please, Stepana. Yes, that um, that is um, pre present in uh, my future slides. Uh, the conditions uh, are by conditions I mean incubation with different substances like the hydroethiandrosterone, um, lipopolysaccharide, which induces inflammation, and the control uh, astrocytes, which were not exposed to any conditions. Thank you for your question. Some more questions. Yes, a question. All the experiments were conducted by me. So you, you, you used two types of cells from brains and uh, yes. stem cells and made real time uh, Yes. <laughs> We used actin as a uh, control gene. Uh, we used only one because um, we first used actin and tubulin, and then we uh, showed that uh, actin and tubulin re le relative levels uh, stays the same, stay the same. So that's why we used only actin as a uh, reference gene. Thank you for your question. Uh, Gamon, your question, please. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, so, dehydrated androsterone uh, 
uh, peaks, uh, its level uh, increases very, uh, very, very significant at the age of like 20 or something in humans, and its concentrations become uh, much higher than of any steroids in like several hundred times. Uh, but then it uh, very dramatically decreases uh, with age and in, um, in the age of 50 or 60 years, its level, it levels re are reduced like um, several hundred times again. So the um, previous investigations uh, uh, suggest that it is a very important mechanism and study aging uh, and anti-aging effects of dehydrated androsterone. Thank you for your question. Do we have some more questions? No? So, let's... <laughs> <laughs> thank you again for your... Thank you again for your speech. And now for the fourth speaker. You can call him, I guess, from tomorrow because his speech is only on the... Uh, scope of bioinformatics rather than bioengineering. So welcome Prosvir of Kirill with his story about microRNAs. Good morning dear colleagues and friends. Today I'm going to present my report which is called microRNA mediated transcriptional regulation of gene expression. Now let's move on. Let's firstly a brief introduction into microRNA as it is the main subject object of the research there are small non-coding RNAs with average length of 20, of 22 nucleotides, and they are known to be responsible for post-transcriptional downregulation of genes. In fact, more than 60% of human protein coding genes are regulated this way. Firstly, microRNA is transcribed as a hairpin structure, which is then, which is then uh, reduced by RNA to RNA enzymes, Grosha and Dicer, pr producing mature RNA, which serves as a matrix, which serves as a matrix for organoff protein to complementary bind to the mRNA and cause either transcriptional inhibition or mRNA degradation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. <laughs> Since 2006, researchers have been reporting the evidence of the new mechanism of microRNA regulation. In 2006, Aganov-2 was reported to be localized in the nucleus and be responsible for, mi for transcriptional regulation, despite the premise that it is a cytoplasmic protein. A year later, later microRNAs turned out to be involved, involved in this process. In general, it looks exactly as in the picture. MicroRNA in complex with Arganov 201, it's still unclear, somehow binds to promote uh, altering gene expression. So one may draw several questions from this. First one is how widespread the regulation, transcription regulation through microRNA in the genome. Are there only several genes regulated this way or thousands of genes? And what is the possible mechanism of interaction between microRNA and DNA, either DNA or RNA? There are two approaches that are likely to help us to answer these questions. The first one is the estimation of the arrangement of conserved microRNA binding sites in promoter region because conservation is the approximation of functional importance. And the second one is the analysis of the response of genes with predicted targets in this promoter upon transfection over expression experiments. As for the second question, there are pos four possible combinatorial types of interaction between microRNA and DNA. On the one hand, microRNA can di directly interact with DNA, forming an extraordinary structure called triplex. It can interact either with sense RNA, sense DNA, strand, strand that contain actual genes, and uh, its partner, antisense DNA. On the other hand, microRNA can interact with RNA, either sense or antisense. As for the first question, we can uh, answer it by following the examples of literature. First example is COX2 gene, which is regulated by microRNA 589 during cell formation. What is specific about this example, what is special about this example is that it contains two different sites. One, one perfect site for microRNA and one site with mismatch, mismatch. This site is not conserved beyond primers because even in mouse it has some mismatches. The mechanism of this regulation is antisense RNA. If we take a close look on other examples found in 10 years, we can see that there is no conserved example except one and the prevalence mechanism is antisense RNA. So we've come to computational part. We, <laughs> we obtained the number of conserved sites for, for 103 conserved microRNA in promoters in seven species up to the horse. So promoter regions can be conserved due to many reasons. So there is a clear need and control. As a control, we obtained artificial microRNAs by permutating microRNAs, preserving gene nucleotide contents. This number performs to expected. As you can see from the top table, numbers for observed number of sites and expected seem to, do not seem to be different. 
if you compare them to numbers of conserved site in three prime UTRs, where absorption is five is six times more than expected, we can we may say that there is no enrichment of conserved site in promoter regions. Having performed 500 permutation, we can easily build some distributions and then estimate p values. As it, can be, as it can be seen from the picture, the values for all mechanisms are quite big, except anti-sensor RNA. In that case, we expect to obtain 14 examples of conserved microRNA binding sites in promote region. But this number is very low to allow us to make it, to build any statistics on it. So further on, we were looking for non-conserved sites in human promoter regions for 2,500 2, microRNAs. To estimate the biological effect of microRNA, researchers also carry out transfection of expression experiments, in which they artificially increase the concentration of microRNA in cell, transferring its suppression effect upon its targets. Then, differential expression of genes is measured, and empirical cumulative distribution functions, shortly ECDFs, are built. As a result, if we have microRNA with several targets, we expect our ECDF for target gene to lay above the ECDF line for all genes. It can be seen from the picture. Blue stands for con oh, black stands for control, and blue stands for microRNA targets. We perform the same. Here are is, here are our ECDFs for sensor RNA mechanism, for anti-sensor RNA mechanism, and ideal ECDF for microRNA 638. It can be seen from the picture. Red curve red curve stands for ECDF for target genes, and blue curve stands for control. As you can be seen from the picture, they do not seem to be different. So there is no effect. To prove this, we analyze the mean fold change of all genes and mean fold change of targeted genes for one microRNA and build a plot. So uh, if we have some theoretical regulation, our line will be blue. <laughs> but we do not have because our line is black or black, red. So there's simply no effect, no? shortly. So in this conclusion, separate examples are not under conserved regulation. There is no evidence of widespread conserved microRNA mediated regulation on the level of transcript. And there is no response of transcription microRNA targets upon transfection over expression experiments. Thank you for your attention. Let us thank you, Kirill, for this very complex walk. And now we have time for questions. <laughs> I see that today is the day of bioengineering. Easy one. <laughs> ah, uh, Stefano was the first. Please, your question. No? No, no question. This one? Yeah. Okay. We take the mean fold change. Oh, thank you for your question. <laughs> hmm? Data. What? Ah. Which data yeah. have you used? Yeah, we oh, thank you for your question. We obtained aggregate of micro micro RNA overexpression experiments. So to this plot. We estimated the mean fold change of all targets and mean fold change for all gene. And if there is a regulation, mean fold mean fold change for all targets will be significantly lower than mean fold change of all genes. So there is a regulation. But in our case, they are simply equal. Thank you for your question. Boris uh, Vanish was uh, your question. It's more comments for slide two. I thought it would be bigger, <laughs> but. <laughs> It was estimated computationally, but it was estimated previously in 2012, I guess. So it's a mathematical estimate. Yes. And was it somehow at least oh. tried to be true? It correlates well with the overexpression data. Thank you for your question. And if you could your question, please. To aggregate fail, I don't know, from one article. From one article. Yes. One article only. Or in some database or something? No, like no database. There is no such database in the net. But just somebody did some y yes. work and just try to compare the results. Some people carry out experiments and put their data on the internet. And That's all how it's how done. How many points are there? Oh, 44. So do you think it's truly enough? 
it may be, <laughs> but I don't know. <laughs> we have some out there, I guess, like this. So in this case, there could be some effect up of upregulation, but it still need to be proved. I don't know. But in general, it seems that there is no effect. So this party proof. Yes. Party yes. Yes, because there is no data. There is more, no more data on the internet. That's all. And uh, we do not carry out experiments in our laboratory. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a question. Uh, you want a question, please? Uh, it means that this point lays out of the distribution. It's out, it lays outside. And this uh, distribution is uh, detected by the... Uh, yes, it's distribution for control targets, which are obtained by permutating microRNA database. Thank you for your question. And we have questions from Denise. Leave your question. <laughs> is theoretical regulation. So if there is an effect, it should look like this. That's all. Thank you for your question. It is some kind of predicted regulation. <laughs> Do we have some more questions? So let's thank Kirill again for his <laughs> for his great work and uh, now it's time for coffee break, I think.